Hi, everyone. Uh, I'm Brian Partridge. I'm an iOS developer on the registry team at Square in New York. And today, I'm going to tell you about how we've started to adopt using CocoaPods for dependency management within our apps. Uh, so this work, this talk actually came out of some work that I started a couple months ago. Uh, I was finishing up some feature work on Register, and uh, my next project wasn't ready to start yet. So I had the opportunity to do a rotation on our foundation team and work on some stuff that would actually impact all the iOS developers on Register. And so this is from that. So to give you some context, uh, these are all our apps. Uh, you're probably familiar with some of them. Register is our primary point of sale. Cash is for person-to-person -person, uh, money transfers. Caviar is for ordering food for delivery. Uh, the customer displays a little sidekick for the register app. And then we have a bunch of internal apps as well. So all of these apps share some code between them. We, have, we generate static libraries, and they're included in each of the apps' dependencies. You're probably familiar with this. You've got categories and helper methods and all, all kinds of great stuff that you bring from project to project. Uh, we do that as well. You know, we have uh, reusable classes for, uh, that act as currency and money and things like that. And so over the years, we create more and more of these libraries and their dependencies that get pulled into each app. But they add up, and they're easy to add. But as they change and have dependencies on like, cross dependencies across each other, it gets really complicated, and dependency management gets really hard. So I'm going to tell you about how we try to deal with that. Uh, so. To give you some more context, here's a simplified dependency graph for Register. Uh, Register consumes Pony Express, which is our library that wraps networking, uh, Square Data, which uh, wraps core data, Protocol Buffers, which handles serialization of data to and from the network, and also Square Core, which is our wrapper around foundation utilities. It's a pretty basic uh, dependency graph. You can probably figure out how it works from here. But it does get complicated as we add more things. So, here I've added the hardware library. We have this library uh, because uh, Square uh, Register interacts with multiple peripherals, barcode scanners, cache rows, et cetera. And adding this library would be fine, except that we can have a conflict with this library. Both Square Data and the hardware library depend on Square Core. And if they depend on different versions of Square Core, if the libraries are built in isolation, not keeping track of what Register will actually use, there can be conflicts. But this also just assumes that we're doing one build configuration. And that's not realistic at all. Every one of these, this app and every one of its libraries has uh, test targets as well, which have their own dependencies, like KIF and OC mock. And then for day-to-day -day development, we have more dependencies, like Pony Debugger and Reveal. And then finally, when we're preparing for release, we have more dependencies, like Crashlytics. So what was once really simple has gotten really complex. And so. We, we need a good way to manage this. And so that's where dependency management comes in. And so what I'd like to do now is tell you about the dependency management solution we were using and how it was and was not working for us, and then what we decided to do about it. So first of all, uh, at Square, all of our code lives in Git. Uh, register uh, is in a Git repository, and it pulls in all of its dependencies as Git submodules. Uh, each of those submodules has an Xcode project. And they, you know, all the targets within those get linked into the app. This is all right. You're probably familiar with it. And it works for uh, really flat dependency graphs. Because, uh, but as soon as things start to get stacked, like you saw with multiple levels of dependencies, it gets really complicated because you're dealing with opaque SHAs as opposed to actual version numbers. There's no semantic meaning between SHA ABC and DEF. There's, there is meaning between version 1.2 and 1.3. And uh, working along with the submodules, we have an internal development tool called Vessel, which takes care of uh, traversing our Xcode projects, identifying dependencies, and handling the linker flags for us. So there were some side effects to this setup. Uh, and so this is why we started looking, uh, reevaluating our dependency management setup. First of all was slow builds. Register itself actually has 20 submodules. And all of those are projects that get pulled in and built from source every time you do a clean build. So this was really slowing things down for us. We have a target of getting to one minute build times on the app, and this was just not going to happen in this scenario. Uh, next uh, was release management. Uh, as Kyle mentioned with the trains, uh, we have uh, one master branch, which is always shippable, and then we have a release branch. And feature development goes into the uh, release branch, or stabilization, 
stabilization goes into the release, release branch, and that gets merged back into master. And uh, when that happens, there can be merge conflicts. If submodules change in each branch, uh, then there's all kinds of messiness. And so we had some scripts for our train conductors to manage this, but it didn't, yes, train conductors. <laughs> uh, <laughs> but there was still a lot of manual work involved, and it was difficult uh, a lot of the time. Uh, and then finally, uh, along the same lines, we had a lot of lost engineer time. We found that we were losing 10 to 15 hours a week of engineer time just futzing with our dependency management system. And that was just not right. We knew there had to be a better way. And so that's why I decided to take this on uh, during my rotation on the foundation team. So I started by creating a spreadsheet, identifying some traditional and non-traditional options for dependency management, and identifying our criteria for what we were actually looking for. On the left was our control, vessel and submodules. And then we looked at vessel and subtrees, CocoaPods, Carthage, and some oddities like Maven and Gradle. Uh, and as you can see, uh, CocoaPods was the one that met most criteria for us. Uh, the only thing that really stood out for us was the workflow impact, but any change of tools is gonna have a workflow change, so we figured that was acceptable for us. Uh, in particular with CocoaPods, some things that were really uh, great for us were semantic versioning. This is getting us away from dealing with opaque SHAs. We would be taking our libraries, which were currently unversioned, and actually adding semantic versions to them. So when we had to deal with uh, the conflicts between the hardware library and Square Data's version of Square Core, uh, we could uh, easily tell you know, which versions uh, were needed, and if a significant uh, version change, like a version one versus version two, would be a conflict that we needed to deal with. Next up, CocoaPods takes care of the dependency resolution for us. So just like I said, uh, version if Square Data requires 1.2 and Hardware Library requires 1.3, CocoaPods will figure it out for us if it can, and it'll get, or it'll at least tell us when things ca uh, can't work together. And then it's on us to figure it out. We figure it out when uh, adding the dependencies to the project rather than at compile time. Uh, next up, CocoaPods supports libraries and doesn't require frameworks. A significant amount of our, what was it, $30 billion going through the app uh, still comes from uh, iOS 7 devices, so we could not uh, make the jump to using frameworks and iOS 8 at this time. Uh, and then finally, CocoaPods is a CLI written in Ruby, and it has a plugin infrastructure, so it's thoroughly extensible. Uh, I figured if there was any functionality that was missing from it, we would be able to add it ourselves or you know, augment it, or it's open source too, so we could you know, commit back to the community. So with our tool selected, the process of actually potifying, this is a new word, I'm gonna push for it, potifying <laughs> our libraries began. Uh, we, it started by uh, setting up a new uh, Git repository in, our, in Stash, our internal uh, source control tool and then going from library to library, creating pod specs for each of the libraries and uh, making them available internally for our apps. Uh, doing, this, doing this, we had a process and I'd like to tell you how we did it. So if you're a team making a similar transition, maybe some of this will work for you. Uh, first of all, start from the bottom up. We, uh, with Vessel, it gave us a great way to generate dependency graphs. And with that, we could actually see where our dependencies were coming from, what depended on what, and it allowed us to pick a library and make a path forward. We'd be able to uh, start at the bottom, potify a library, then move up the tree and see that library immediately consumed by the next thing that we worked on. It was really satisfying when that worked. Uh, next, start small. Uh, you saw our apps earlier and there are, they're varying size. Uh, small apps have sm ha tend to have fewer dependencies and so by starting with apps with fewer dependencies, we hit a lot of the common dependencies, and we were actually not only making progress on uh, cache, for example, but we would also be making progress on register and several other apps. Uh, smaller apps also have smaller teams, so this was a great way to introduce smaller teams to the new workflow and vet that uh, and work out kinks with that uh, before actually having to push that on the register team, which is our, one of our bigger teams. Uh, next up was tests. Uh, when you're potifying an app, you don't need to do the whole app. You, if your app has a test target, or, or if your library has a test target, you can just do that first. This was a good way for us to add KIF and OCMock to our uh, test targets, and actually let a, let a team get used to that workflow, then introduce them to actually potifying the whole app, and then, you know, everyone was happy. <laughs> uh, 
And then finally, test again. Uh, every library that we created a pod spec for, we also added an extra Xcode. Pro e yeah. Every library that we created a pod spec for, we also added an extra Xcode project. Uh, and this is built by CI. So every time that library changes, CI builds that Xcode project, which consumes that pod spec, so that we can verify we never publish a pod spec that cannot actually be consumed by one of our apps. There's never going to be that a phantom version 4.3 out on the spec server that cannot be consumed that everyone just needs to worry about forever. It's not going to happen. Uh, during this process, there were some challenges that I'd like to tell you about in case you run into them too. Uh, first of all, was partial podification. Uh, initially, Vessel and CocoaPods couldn't work together because they both wanted to integrate with the consuming app uh, using XC config files. And if we tried to use them together, they would stomp all over each other. Uh, but because of the extensibility in uh, CocoaPods uh, file formats, we could actually uh, uh, integrate the XC config files from Vessel into the CocoaPods generated config files through some post build steps. Uh, to do this, I generated, uh, I wrote an uh, internal tool uh, that basic, that did this, and uh, I called it Escape Pod because it gave us a <laughs> safe, smooth way to move away from using Vessel. Uh, the next challenge was along the lines of code generation. Uh, our protocol buffer bindings are generated based on protocol buffer definition files. Those things change. We need to regenerate bindings, and so when we do that, we also need to create a pod spec for them. Um, Part of the process, uh, initially, I tried uh, making a pod spec that would generate the uh, source files on demand, but it turned out to be s too slow. So we ended up going back and augmenting our existing code generation, code generation process so that it would generate the bindings, then generate a pod spec, test the pod spec so that it could be consumed, and publish it internally so that you know, everything could be immediately consumable by the apps. And then finally, the last challenge uh, is concurrent development. This is something that we still uh, deal with, and we're hoping to come up with a solution for it soon. Um, it's basically, it's not uncommon for, to, for us to see a bug in register that we need to go in and fix in square data or square core, develop that fix locally, then just rebuild the register target and, have, uh, and verify the fix. Unfortunately, CocoaPods in our environment doesn't really facilitate this because of the way that we have levels of dependencies and cross dependencies. Uh, but there's uh, some hope, and uh, I'll get to that in a little bit. So after this process, this is where we are now. Uh, all the apps that have the CocoaPods logo next to them have been fully podified, and the teams are <laughs> we're just taking a picture. Uh, <laughs> uh, so these have been fully podified. The teams working on them are using CocoaPods every day. Uh, Cache is up next. All of its dependencies are ready. We just need to uh, make a move on that. And register is almost ready, too. There's a couple more dependencies to go. Uh, looking at this, I'm really satisfied with our progress. And I, I was really glad to be able to work on something that affected uh, the majority of the iOS team. Uh, and also, in particular, I want to thank members of the CocoaPods development team. There's several of them here tonight uh, for the work that they've done, both on the tool and on the guides on their website, which were super, super helpful. So thank you for that. So in the future, uh, we're going to continue investing in CocoaPods at Square to improve our build processes. In particular, I mentioned earlier, we want to have faster builds. Uh, we have a target of one minute build times, and you know, we want to get to that. The first thing that we're going to do in that regard is we're going to target binary pods. We're going to try and have CI build our new versions of our pods for us so that we aren't building the same version of Square data over and over and over again. We build it once, we consume a binary pod, and then everything goes faster. And then finally, we're going to be working on some plugins. Uh, in particular, I've got some ideas about how we can work around the issues with concurrent development. And if that works, you'll be hearing about that sometime soon. Uh, thank you. Uh, that's all for me. I'll be around afterward if you, want, if you have any questions or if you want to know more. And next up, please welcome Alan Feinberg.